Welcome back to AM Northwest. Our first guest was a Major League Baseball reporter for Sports Illustrated when she was barred from the locker room at the 1977 World Series. She took on the MLB to court, to court and her victory opened locker room doors for female journalists everywhere. We welcome the author of Locker Room Talk, A Woman's Struggle to Get Inside. Melissa Ludke, thank you so much for joining us. The book is fascinating. It's really about the history of women in sports. It's absolutely interesting. Why write this now? This couple, happened back yeah. in the, in the yeah. 70s, early 80s. You know, a couple reasons. One is that young women came knocking on my door. I mean, not literally at my yeah. home, but they would write to me that they were doing their thesis or they wanted to do a National History Day project. Professors were starting to call me and say, I see a lot more young women coming into our sports media classes, our sports journalism classes, and we frankly don't have anything to give them in right. terms of resources. So I would start Skyping originally and then Zooming into those classrooms. And it was really that prompt um, that, that convinced me, along with the fact that I have a 28-year-old daughter. Yeah. And I began thinking about her generation and the history they did not know from this period in my life. And I felt it was in some ways my obligation to tell this story. Absolutely. You were 26, you were working at Sports Illustrated as the reporter for, uh, you were doing ba covering baseball. That's right. Take me to the World Series, the Yankees won the World Series and they're blocking you from getting inside the locker room. Yes, well even prior to them Here's actually. Here's your pass that you had. That's you right, had been given that's right, initially. that's right. They, I had the pass. I had been in the Yankees clubhouse prior to that because of the work that I had done with their PR staff to enable that to happen. It was all below the radar screen. No one had written about me being in the clubhouse. So when the World Series started, the only thing that I saw as a possible barrier would be the Dodgers who had no women covering them. So I did my mother may I, yeah. and I went over to the Dodgers, talked with Tommy John, the player rep, he ended up having them take a vote of the team, and they voted that even, you know, that I had a right to be there. Right. And it was that, uh, me going to the Dodgers, them taking that vote that alerted the commissioner to this possibility that I would be in the clubhouse. He knew nothing about what was going on with the Yankees. Why and, did yeah. he bar you? He barred me uh, for reasons uh, that sounded absurd to me that night, at least the reasons that were told to me, not by him, but by his messenger. One, he said they hadn't consulted the wives. And I asked them on what decisions had they consulted wives in baseball. Right. That ended up with a no response. Right. And then they told me that the children of the players would be ridiculed by their classmates the next day in school. You'd have to really go through a convoluted kind of right. maze to figure out how those children would even find out that I was there. So those were just ridiculous reasons. Yeah. In court, it came down to, and in the court of public opinion, uh, the commissioner framed his argument as though he were protecting what he called the sexual privacy of his players. Sexual privacy was never an issue because I was barred not only after the game where people think about the players changing clothes even though we're not allowed anyone in the shower area, right. but I was barred also in the 50 minutes before the game. Players come in after batting practice, they keep their uniforms on the entire time. Yeah. So there was no issue of nudity or, in his words, sexual privacy, and yet I was excluded at that time, too. So he used that as a fig leaf uh, in terms of the court of public opinion, in which I lost. Yeah, and the, the public opinion, um, you, were, you were chastised, you were demeaned, you were harassed, you yes. were, they <laughs> called you girl in the courtroom, they called you girl everywhere. So other sports reporters wrote about you and, and referred to you as a gal or, you know, almost damsel. as if you, damsel. Damsel was damsel. one of my favorites, yeah. yes, yes. As <laughs> acting as if you wanted attention from the male players. And it even made national, it was on uh, SNL. It was. Had a skit. Yeah, O.J. Simpson was the host that night and he and Lorraine Newman did a skit in the locker room. Uh, Tommy, uh, 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 the Tonight and it Show. And it was demeaning yeah. for you to make Well, it, it was. It was mocking. It yeah. was very mocking. And those those that were supposed to be humorous hit me, obviously, in a very different way. You were 26 and going through all of this national attention. I and was. you just wanted to cover baseball. Well, that's how naive I was. When they asked me if I would put my name on as the plaintiff in this lawsuit when Time Inc. decided to go ahead yeah. with it. 
I said yes immediately, but I did it through the lens of just wanting to do this magical job that I had been given the opportunity to do it at such a young age. Yeah. And I was frankly very good at it. I'd done my homework, I'd done my work, I'd learned how to do it. And that World Series was the first opportunity I had been given by the magazine to be assigned to and the to World of Series. all the series. Yeah. Dodgers versus the Yankees. And uh, here we are uh, again. Uh, right? This is crazy. <laughs> I also want to talk about, though, but cartoonists, yeah. you know, lampooned you. Um, and, uh, Johnny Carson. Yes. Did the same thing. With Betty White. With Betty White. Had Betty White ended up with the towel around her. Yeah. I mean, that was so preposterous. They had the wrong idea of, you know, who was supposed I was supposed to be equal to in my access. They did, cartoonists did ones where players would hold up underwear, you know, for me to put on and say, if oh you want to be equal, put these on. And, you know, people say to me, well, were the players more difficult or the sports writers? I'd have to say overwhelmingly the sports writers were more difficult in terms of sort of understanding what this case was yeah. about. The players were much more understanding and showing by their vote that they understood that even though it might make them uncomfortable, right. it might change the ways that they operated in you know, their again, own locker room. They're, you're not they in agree. the shower area. You they can't come be. out, they can you put can't their be. underwear on, yeah. they can do all that. Yeah. You and could look you could look in the pages of my magazine at that time, which was filled with advertisements, and you could see ball players posing in jockey underwear yeah. in my pa my pages of my magazine. And yet it seemed too cumbersome for them to put on a pair of underwear when they came out of the shower area yeah. into the place where we were permitted, put a towel around themselves. Uh, put a bathrobe on, whatever they wanted to do. Uh, but in fact, baseball insisted that that was going to change forever the traditions of baseball. Right. If I thought yeah. it was really interesting. First of all, your book is fascinating. Thank it you. is history. <laughs> um, you had just a name drawn out of a hat, the first black female judge, federal judge on your case. She knew nothing about baseball, didn't care about baseball, um, but she had to learn through the course of the, of the trial and all of that, right? It was Con something else. Constance so, Baker Motley. No wonder she didn't have time to watch sports. She was busy. She was overturning the Jim Crow laws in right. the segregated South by uh, taking ten cases to the Supreme Court and arguing them, and eventually winning all ten cases. I feel like it says something about the two of you fighting what needed to be fought. So many things that needed to be. Where do you think we are now? How do you feel about what you change in the course of history? Yeah, I want to just go back for a sure. second, just say that so many of the precedents, legal precedents that she was involved in setting in her cases on racial discrimination were in fact in place and referenced in my hearing. Many cases that oh, were wow. brought to court during that era set, set in, in uh, you know, in legal history what she used in many instances to rule for on the 14th Amendment in my case. So I think it's a fascinating tale of how you take the law from one societal movement right. of that that she was very involved in into gender, which was just becoming a case that was taken seriously by judges under that Equal Protection Clause. And that was only due to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So you have all of these kind of historic figures yeah. coming across the stage, uh, you know, in my book. Yeah, it is absolutely fascinating. We want yep. to tell everyone the book again is titled Locker Room Talk, A Woman's Struggle to Get Inside. Melissa Lucky, thank you so much. I wish we had more time to talk. I this always was, do this too, was thank great. you so much. Thank you. We'll be right back with more AM Northwest, don't go away.